Hey folks, welcome to The Artist Craft. I am your host, Stacey Cochran, and I am super thrilled to have in studio today, Kate DiCamillo, who is one of the most beloved authors of our time. Her books for young readers have sold millions and millions of copies worldwide. The major film adaptation of her Newbery Medal winning novel, The Tale of Despero, was released to global audiences in 2008. She is a National Book Award finalist for The Tiger Rising and her Because of When Dixie was a Newbery Honor book and was made into a major motion picture. Her latest book is Bink and Golly. Uh, Miss Di Camillo lives in Minneapolis. Thank you very much for joining us in studio today. Thank you for having me. Call me Kate. Miss okay. DiCamillo, that's alarming, you know. Kate it is. All right, good. Well, thank you for, for being in studio today. So let's start first by talking about story. All right. For you as a reader, when you're reading something or watching a movie. I love talking about myself as a reader as opposed to a writer. Okay, as a reader. Well, we're going to get you. to the writer stuff. Okay. But to start with, for, for, for being a reader, what are the qualities of a story that, that make for the best stories? Um... Well, one, a love of language, but that's but there's also got to be a love of story. So if somebody's telling me a story, I want a story to be there. And then I look for a sense of humor and uh, imagination and uh, a certain kind of like love of uh, life, humanity, people. I always think of Richard Russo's uh, uh, the first book I read of his, which was Nobody's Fool. And um, th did you ever read that? I haven't. You need to read that. And he just loved all of his people so much, as broken and messed up as they were. And that quality I always look for in a storyteller, in addition to the love of language, in addition to humor, and in addition to a story. Where does that love come from? Because it shows up in all of your work. There's such humanity and com compassion. Oh, on now the page. now you switched over to me. I'm See, switching you to you like as a that. Writer. You like you messed with me because you wanted to talk about reading and it's what the bait I like and to switch. read. Yeah, it is. That's so exactly where does the love? But, but seriously, when you write, you you obviously care deeply for these characters. Yes, I so love where does them. that come from? Is it? I don't. You know, it's and and maybe you experience this too when you write. It's. I feel like I'm. Um, uh, before I would have said accessing a better self, and now I think I'm accessing my best self. That's that's um, me, mm -hmm. and which I have denied for a long time. And it's, so it's interesting that you want to talk about the therapeutic qualities of it, because I've said no, that's something better than me coming through me. But that's my best self, um, my most loving self that shows. Up for and it's stories. pure. It's totally. I think that's what's so cool about your books uh, and your stories is it's not, you know, fabricated. It's totally authentic. I, I would have argued with you. All I know now is that writing the books has taught me how to be a better uh, person and how to open myself up more and how to love. Sure. In some of your best stories, you you've got qualities of of forgiveness of compassion, but, but underlying stories like The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane, Because of Winn-Dixie, there, there is a sense of loneliness yes. and of melancholy. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about uh, how you as a writer, when you sit down to write a story, how do you conceive of things like hope in relationship to melancholy? I don't ever think of it in, in terms of those big concepts because I would surely drop the ball and never make it, you know, well, now I'm messing with the sports metaphor, I shouldn't do that. But I don't think, uh, how am I gonna put hope in here? It seems, um, and, and, I, and this is, you know, I have enough books now that I have um, critics who will tell me what my themes are. And, and it's true, they keep on showing up again and again and one of those themes is hope. Um, and s but it shows up no matter what I do. It seems to be um, a part of me that um, will not go away. So um, th the same as there's the despair and loneliness that won't go away either, um, but is balanced out by the hope. And that's me, and it all shows up in the story. 
and without that, me thinking about it too much. And that's one of the things, if I have a hunch or a hypothesis about, about those kinds of qualities that go into a story, uh, it is that I, I wonder if a writer has to know. I mean, you have to know what that feeling is like of being that lonely, of being that desperate, to be able to write it authentically, right? Yeah, now I feel like I'm going to cry a little bit. Don't worry, I won't, because that would make you very nervous, wouldn't it? No, it would be... Do you have it, a tissue it, with it, you? We'd have ratings then. <laughs> <laughs> See, now you made me laugh, so it's not going to happen. Sure, I know those things. Everybody knows those things, though. Don't some, we all But some know writers those don't things? put that as, as purely in their books. It seems, it seems so clear in some of your works, the, the feeling of, of loneliness and, and melancholy, and yet you're able to offset that always with this sense of humor, a sense of hope. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about all that and thinking about where I started as a writer, which was, I think, where a lot of people start short stories. They're short, mm -hmm. therefore they are easier, which of course is completely erroneous. And um, I still write short stories, but I'm thinking that part of what you're saying is a gift of writing for kids um, and that um, you feel duty-bound um, morally almost for the hope to be there. And so it balances out that that darker part of myself and you also feel duty bound <clears throat> to tell the truth which is weird when I'm talking about talking mice and you know dungeons and saving princesses and all of that kind of stuff but I feel like I have to tell the, the truth and so that's the darkness and the hope but both of those things go in there and they end up there in because I'm writing for children. I think that is part of the reason that both of those things are there. Does that make sense? It does. Uh, the author is Kate DiCamillo. The book that she's on tour for is Bink and Golly. Uh, it's available everywhere as well as many of her other books, in, including The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane because of Winn-Dixie uh, and many others. Uh, at the 2009 uh, National Book Festival, you said uh, that- Were you there? No, I watched it on YouTube, actually. Oh, really? This was so the you YouTube did do question. some research on YouTube. Okay. You, you said that writing saved you. What did you mean? What, what is, how did it save you? What, is, what does that mean? Um, you're just not going to go for the easy questions, are you? Well, you're not, you're not an easy writer. <laughs> um, uh, I mean what we were talking about in the beginning, that um, through writing I was able to access that better part of myself and then that better part of myself um, came into uh, I came into daily contact the stories that I wrote taught me how to be a better person so were you evil or something before <laughs> no I wasn't um, what was the change what happened between when you graduated from college <laughs> And then, yeah. and then something happened when you wrote Because of Winn-Dixie. That story worked. Right. Um, well, do you want everything that happened from college up to Winn-Dixie? Because I can condense it into a, sure. you know, a, a small, dreary one-act play of me sitting wearing a black turtleneck, looking um, bored and disdainful, and having everybody go, oh, that's Kate. She writes. So that was what I did from the time I was 20 until the time I was 30 and I didn't write, you know. I just called myself a writer and said, well, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write. So that was like a decade of talking about being a writer, wanting to be a writer, thinking, I think maybe I can do this, and then finally realizing at 30 that I could very well go to the grave talking about doing it and not having done so it. So why weren't you writing? For me, that's hard to believe <laughs> that you didn't do any writing. I didn't. Um, I, because I was afraid and, and because I was lazy. And so, and, and getting back to our theme of me becoming a better person, that's part of what writing told me, taught me, was like that, that showing up, you know, that that's so much of what matters in life. It's just like it's showing up. I made the commitment and I've honored that commitment ever since I made it of, okay, I'm gonna write two pages a day. And so that 
that showing up for myself and for the story helped me become a better person. And then rummaging around in my heart to tell that story about the girl and the dog um, opened me up in a way and helped me to see what was in front of me and to be uh, grateful for it. How personal was the story because of Windex? Oh, I didn't think it was personal at all. You know, it's only after the fact that I've learned to see how closely related it is to me and to my own experience. I thought I was just, you know, making the whole thing up. And mm -hmm. it's funny because I was in Boston last week for like a 10th anniversary kind of thing because it's been 10 years since that book has come out and we watched the movie. Um, and I was just struck dumb because it's been five years since I've seen the movie and there was all this distance now about how watching that child, watching Opal, because I've always said, oh, Opal's not me. You know, people mistake me for Opal because it's a first person narrative, but how much that's, that's me. So now you see it. Now I see it, but more. I'm actually, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a very slow study, you know. What did that take, 10 years? So do you pull from, for your best stories, do you pull from your, certainly you're from your own emotions, but from your own experiences uh, as well? Sure, and I don't, again, I don't intend to. Let's talk about Edward Tulane, which is the first book of mine that you found, and, mm -hmm. and your wife made you read it? We found it in a, in a chain store in Arizona, and she put it in my hands, and I remember reading a particular passage, and it must have been an emotional day or something, but it, it, it really choked me up. There was something about the loss of hope in the story, and then Edward becoming a better person. You know, he starts yeah. off this kind of nasty, arrogant rabbit, uh, and right. something about being separated and lonely, you know, makes him aware of being a better person. I mean, that's, it's like that's what you're saying is, when you answered the question, you know, how writing saved you, that it's basically your story. Yeah, that's, and that's just what I'm like sitting here with my mouth open while you're saying all that, thinking, well, that's what happened to me. And I never, I never thought about that at all until this very moment. Hmm, that's interesting. That's, yeah. that's hard to believe, too. Mm -mm. Yeah, no, I never thought about that because I mean, Edward is one of those happy books that when people say, where did you get the idea, which you get all the time, mm -hmm. I have an actual physical answer, which is, you know, I was given a sure. rabbit doll. And so it's like, here, this, you know, and then I had a dream about him, you know, uh, on the ocean floor without any clothing on, talk about therapy, right? And I thought, oh, that would make a good picture book, you know. And the whole thing just told itself. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't have to do anything to that book. I mean, it was like four drafts, which for me is nothing. I, it usually takes me so many drafts. So I always felt like the book was a gift and that I had just stumbled upon it. And I never thought about it in terms of, well, this is what happened to me as a writer. This has been my journey is that it has opened me in a way that um, I never would have anticipated. Now your second book, Stepping Back, before the mir Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane was uh, The Tiger Rising, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. Yeah. And it was your second book. Second book, yeah. How does getting that kind of recognition at that stage of your career though, how does it, you know, how does it set the stage for what has happened in the next, you know, eight years or the it's it, it was it's it's you know it's the way every writer thinks that they want to start out, but it's actually very very terrifying to get mm -hmm. because when Dixie is a very small book about a girl who finds a dog and and I had worked enough at the periphery of the publishing industry to have very realistic expectations for what would happen. My grand scheme was that 5,000 copies would sell. I would earn back my advance and I would be allowed to do another one. You know, that was the big hope. And then it just became this book that people loved. And fortunately, Tiger Rising was already done by the, the time when Dixie came out. So I didn't have to think, okay, what am I gonna do next? But I did have to sit there and think, well, I want to write another book like When Dixie. I want, I want people to, to love me that mm -hmm. way again, and which of course is you can't write that way. You can't write to make people love you, and you can't write to, um, 
because people want, because that's what people wanted was another story like that. And so that's where Despero came from, was like, if I'm going to keep doing this, I'm going to have to go in a completely different direction and, um, and, and gamble everything mm -hmm. and hope I don't get kicked off the team, you know. And the tale of Despero is, it's a much more technically complex story. You, you it had a plot. That was exciting. Yeah. You <laughs> I've together. never had a plot before. You weave together multiple points of view. Yeah. I'm wondering if, uh, you know, again, I might be reading too much into this, but uh, you were a little bit better established at that point. You had, you know, you had the first book out, and somewhere, you, I, well, what's not clear is whether you had the second book out and you were working on The Tale of Despero at that point, but you had confidence. You knew that, okay, I've got a publisher who I might be interested. Have, I didn't have confidence because I was stuck back on that. If I don't do something else, like when Dixie, not Tiger Rising, because Tiger Rising was actually too dark for some mm -hmm. people. Um, and, um, but Winn-Dixie was just beloved. And I thought, I have to do something like that. So I had no confidence at all. I thought, I'm going to go and do this book about a mouse and a princess with a really intrusive narrator. And I am, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my, my, my little readership. It's just mm. going to dissipate. And I, but I thought. I, I just realized I wasn't going to be able to do it if I was sitting there thinking I have to do it to make other people happy or to get loved. You're looking at me in a very um, disturbing way. Well, no, I, it makes sense. I think it makes sense that you, you do seem to write with a sense of anxiety that you're going to be found out, that this is, <laughs> that you're a fraud. You know, right, I read that sure. somewhere. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Even now, even now, you probably wonder. Yeah, you how a, a, did I any any event, anything, you wait for the person to stand up and go. Exactly that, you imposter, sit down. Yeah. But it is. I mean, now you you, you know, you're writing. You're part of the machinery of publishing. You know that if you write another book, that there will be, ready readers to read the book. How does that change the the, the psychology of of being a writer from, you know, writing the very first story that maybe wasn't published to then writing when dixie it you, you know no matter what you do you've got people on your shoulder mm -hmm. um so before when i was writing and i thought sending out to you know literary magazines and um getting um rejected you that's what's on your shoulder knowing that you, you might never be able to break through that barrier and now what's on my shoulder is I'm going to do it, and like you said, unless it's just egregious, they're going to publish it, mm -hmm. and it's going to go out into the world. So it's going to get read, and I'm going to make a fool out of myself because everybody will see it because it will get published because of what's come before. So that's the fear now. Yeah. So yeah, I just you know, it's a rotating, it's a merry-go-round of fears. It's like you know, um, it, it's very anxiety-ridden. Don't you feel that way? Don't you feel? Anxious, or is it just me? Am I the only whack job that's writing? No, I think everybody knows what anxiety <laughs> is all about. Uh, I think what you're able to do so well is you're able to take that anxiety and that fear, offset it by love and compassion and hope, uh, and and put it into a very, you know, well articulated story, which is you know what really captivates readers, and I think it's that balance of hope that that's to me as a reader anyways, that's what I love, is, is to see that fear battling hope and love. Yeah. And at the end of the day, hope and love win. Win. It's, it's a compromised win, but it's a win. When um, I did a Christmas book, like, I don't know, three or four years ago, called Great Joy, and so then, you know, I had to go out and talk about it and stuff. And this is one of the things that I love about going out and talking about it is you find out what things are about and what you're doing, you know, because you don't, it's, it's always kind of mysterious to me. And I, I realize there's that book ends um, with a two-page wordless spread of everybody in the church social hall uh, after a pageant. Um, somebody has been brought inside from uh, out, literally from the cold and dark inside into the warmth. And, and, and going around and talking about that book, I thought this is what I am doing. Every time I tell a story, I'm always reaching for this moment when everybody comes in from the outside and gathers together in a well-lighted room. Pardon me, Mr. 
Hemingway. You know, it's that. <laughs> That's always what I'm working towards um, is that moment. And it shows up again and again and again. And almost always it's literally a table, you know, and it's literally these people around it, you know. The first five years of your life you had recurring pneumonia year mm -hmm. after year. Yep. Uh, what is the dominant memory from that time of your life? What really stands out? Fear. I was terrified mm. all the time. Um, it was in the days when, you know, um, you weren't, I, I had parents, they were attentive parents, but you were left at the hospital kind of thing. It was like, oh, don't, don't coddle them. So I was, you know, I was there a lot alone and um, not worried about being sick because as a kid you don't really think about that, but worried about getting in, in trouble with the nurses and just, yeah, I was afraid all the time. And your dad did not, he didn't come with you to Florida. No. No, we moved to Florida because of the, ostensibly because of me and the pneumonia, and then my dad did not um, come. How does that impact you at it, that age? Everything. It's everything. It's part of why I'm sitting here talking to you, you know? And it's, um, you make, you try to fill that hole for the rest of your life, and part of the way to fill that hole is to tell a story, you know? So if you had it to, if you had it a do-over in life and you could choose the success of, of the books that you've had or your dad staying with you, and it was an either or, which would you choose? Uh, I couldn't even answer that. I wouldn't be myself if he, ha it was such a defining thing mm. that I can't imagine who I would be um, if he had stayed. I can't, I can't conceive of that person. And so I would have to not vote for the success of the books, but vote for the person that I am because it, it changed me in, in good ways and in bad ways, that, that quote-unquote abandonment, you know. The author is Kate DiCamillo. Uh, the book that she's on tour for right now is Bink and Golly. There are many others. They're outstanding. Check them out. If you haven't heard of her, she's uh, one of the best authors we've ever had in the studio, and I'm just thrilled to have you here. Uh, do I have to say something after all those compliments? That, that, that makes me want to cry, too. Okay. Are we done? No. Not yet. Okay. So tell us a little bit about, you've had some success now with film adaptations yeah. of the stories. What is it like to, do you have a couple of stories about maybe one seeing the tale of Despero? Sure, I do. I've got stories about all of it, and um, it's, uh, you know, I've come, and you know this from writing, it's just like you're, it's always a process of letting the story go. There's a wonderful essay by Ann Patchett about you compromise your novel from the minute you put the first couple words down on page because you've compromised the beautiful thing that's in your head mm. that you will never capture. You know, it's a compromise. And so from that point on, it's a series of compromises. You compromise in the editing process. You compromise when it goes, goes out into the world because you cannot stand over every reader and go, this is what I intended here, you know, do you like this here? You have to let it go, and, and all of that is said in the movies is, is just continuing along that spectrum. It's the same as letting it be translated when the books are in, I know something ridiculous like 42 languages now. I don't know, I cannot say what they say in, you know, um, Estonian or, you know, I just, so I have to let it go. It is an act of faith. It is, and it, it's an act of faith not in me, but in the story and in the reader, and also just in the primacy of the story. So Despero, which was actually very different than the book, still um, had a lot of the same thematic concerns as the book. Um, <clears throat> and so I was, you know, I was able to look at it and see it as a beautiful, different thing. Um, and. Uh, when Dixie, which is actually much more, um, it's, it hues more closely to the book, um, and I was much more involved in that, um, I learned, you know, my first lessons there that you're not going to be able to control anything and that you're going to have to let it go. And it was fabulous to be involved, and it was also fabulous to realize I'm, I'm not going to be able to control it. If I want to control things, I'm going to write a, a novel, um, but I can't, you know, in a movie. So it's all been good and instructive and taught me more about story and about the, the power of story. When did you first see Because of Winn-Dixie? 
Um, I actually was very involved with that and worked um, on the screenplay a lot and got to go to the set. And um, so I saw it in bits and pieces. I saw dailies and that kind of thing. And um, and then they, you know, sent finished ones before it went out into the the theater. So, um, but it was really interesting to me to watch um, five years after I'd seen it, and and I just responded to it as a story that had, you know, that I had had nothing to do with except for that thing of seeing myself so much so clearly in Opal. Fascinating. Yeah. Again, the author is Kate D. Camillo. Uh, the book that she's on tour for is Bink and Golly. Uh, there are many others to check out. Check out our website, uh, katedcamillo.com, for, for all the information on, on what Kate is up to. Uh, so one of our audiences for, for this show is really a lot of aspiring writers, um, and that's how it makes its way onto the web. So how, how does, to me, it seems like your story is very complex, but one of the central components is perseverance. Yes. How does how does perseverance how does it shape you? How does that that struggle from 21 or 22 to to, to writing the first <laughs> book? How does perseverance shape you as a writer? Well, um, I like took some of the tenets of you know I, when I was younger and when I wasn't writing, I was I, I ran all the time. And I suddenly had this dim light bulb go on in my head that I could make this commitment to running, that I could show up, that I could see that I got better and better at it by showing up and doing it every day, that I felt good about having done it once it was done. And I thought, well, what if I duh, made some kind of commitment like that to writing, which I say is so important to me, and yet I'm not doing it. And so that was where I learned my first lesson about it. And then I, I learned to persevere with myself and to commit to myself. But then also, when the rejection letters started coming, that's another level of perseverance. Um, so you have to be able to accept the rejection letter, take the story, package it up, send it back out again. That kind of perseverance is necessary. And then you and I were talking before the show started about luck, and you were going to get ready to like uh, tangle up with me about luck. But I think luck is, uh, you know, you're not going to get lucky unless you're showing up and, and doing the work. That's, that's indisputable. But there is something to be said in being in the right place at the right time. And I don't know how you make that happen. And I feel that's what happened to me. I was in the right place at the right time. Well, we're just about out of time. Speaking of time, uh, here today I could easily talk for an hour, two hours, three hours. Yeah, I wish you would talk because I feel like I've been going yap, 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 yap. But yap, we, so. have, uh, we have time constraints, unfortunately. <laughs> Kate, thank you very much for joining us thank in you. studio. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And for all of us here at the Artist Craft, Michael and Marnie working hard in the control room and the folks over at Master Control, thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Fade out. Yeah. Right. And the audio will come down. You and did almost make me twice yeah it's all about loneliness I think that's at the end of the day I think the best writers are finding a way to to bridge loneliness you know uh, it's 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 tackling that